Uh, quite simply, it's the fact that I think a free society is both morally and economically superior to uh, any kind of alternative that anybody's ever tried or anybody's ever suggested. Hello, welcome again to the episode of the Let People Prosper show. My name is Dr. Vance Ginn. I hope you're having a prosperous day. Well, today I'm delighted to have on someone who knows a lot about social capital, what it means to increase it or not have enough of it, and what it means for you. And it's none other than John Phelan. John, welcome to the Let People Prosper show. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on, uh, and I think we're going to have a good discussion today. But before we get into all the fun stuff, um, let me read your bio so people, the audience will know a little bit about you, and then we'll jump right into it. So John Phelan is an economist at the Center for, of the American Experiment. He is a graduate of Birkbeck College, University of London, where he earned a BSc in economics and of the London School of Economics, where he earned his master's degree. Um, John worked in finance for 10 years before becoming a professional economist. He worked at Capital Economics in London, where he wrote reports ranging from the impact of Brexit on the British economy to the effect of government regulation on cell phone coverage. John has written for City AM in London and for The Wall Street Journal in both Europe and the U.S., as well as new newspapers across the Midwest. He has also been published in Journal of Economic Affairs. So, John, with all that stuff that's going on, uh, I look forward to talking about a lot of that. Um, what motivates you to do what you do every day? Uh, quite simply, it's the fact that I think a free society is both morally and economically superior to uh, any kind of alternative that anybody's ever tried or anybody's ever suggested. Um, I grew up uh, initially in a city called Sheffield in England, which was, um, I suppose, uh, you know, Britain's answer to Pittsburgh in a lot of respects. Uh, I was a Steelers fan as a young kid because uh, Pittsburgh and Sheffield were supposed to be the same thing. Um, and this is, and the Steelers were rubbish at the time, by the way. This is like 1988, <laughs> 89. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, um, that city had been famous at one point for steel manufacture, and it was also mm. the headquarters of the coal industry. And these things were just, you know, dead on their feet coming into the early 80s. My dad actually worked in the steel works. Um, and instead of there being any kind of rationalization of these things, uh, what happened is people dug in and defended these dead industries. Um, and in the end, the cost of uh, unwinding these things and moving on was much, much higher than it needed to be. And the city just kind of died. Hmm. And this city that had been kind of like a leading light in the Victorian economy became this kind of awful place with 30% unemployment and huge drug problems. Um, and then you moved, you know, we moved to the South and, um, you know, things are very, very different there. There's much more entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and, you know, I just kind of saw that if you let people free, um, they will generally find their own way on average, yeah. um, far better than if they're not free. Yeah. Yeah. Well put there. I think you're hitting on a lot of key things that I want to talk about today. Um, getting you to where you're at today, because um, you live in Minnesota now, right? Yep. Okay. We're at in Minnesota. Uh, I live just outside the Twin Cities. I mean, I suppose okay. I, I live in the Twin Cities, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Got gotcha, you. Got gotcha. you. I'm near Austin, Texas. So I'm in a place called Round Rock, just north of Austin. Oh, yeah. uh, a little different, a little different there, but, <laughs> but, but there's a lot of similarities in some sense of how much more government there's been here recently. And uh, compared with a lot of Texas, uh, it's much more expensive to live in Austin. Um, but I, I wonder kind of what got you where you're at today. I mean, I, I love where you talked about economic freedom and getting people to, to, to prosper or, or have them more free so they can do what's in their own best interest. But I wonder what kind of your path was to get to this, this, this stage where you're at today. Well, I never really thought about economics very much, actually. Yeah. I, I started doing it at school and then dropped it because I thought it was lame, um, which is, I guess, kind of funny when I look at it now. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I was actually recovering from a minor surgery at my parents' house, hmm. and I was bored. And my dad had a lot of books lying around, and two particularly um, I read. Um, and this is after I kind of started working as an accountant. Hmm. Um, I read these two books, and they were The Road to Serfdom and Free to Choose, which I think hmm. is probably – a lot of people's kind of entry into this. And I read particularly free to choose, you know, I, uh, having had some experience, I'm in my early twenties now, so this is 22, 23. Um, and it, 
it kind of tallied, you know, this book was it kind of explained everything, you know. Mm. Um, so there was the world, I saw it and it was like someone was lifting a veil and you could see behind it. Um, and I got into, uh, there was a, fun, a book called A World Without Walls by Michael Moore, um, mm. not that one. Um, a guy who'd been pr prime minister, I think, in New Zealand in the 80s. Um, a Labour Party prime minister, but in New Zealand, Labour means the kind of small government liberal thing, weirdly. Um, but he was some kind of big cheese in the WTO. And I read this book, uh, World Without Walls, and it was all about the benefits of free trade, globalization, hmm. um, which were my kind of initial uh, interests. But I, I figured, you know, because I've been to university and dropped out, um, and I figured, you know, well, I'm kind of done with this. Um, I just, just a kind of interest, you know. But I actually managed to, there is a college in London, Birkbeck, um, which tailors for kind of mature students, which I mm. was at the time. Um, so I went back, did my economics degree there. Then I did my postgrad at the LSE. And that enabled me to change my career from accountancy um, into uh, economics. And initially I was a kind of consultant, you know, um, mm -hmm. bit of a higher gun. You would get, do all, whatever you got hired to do, you would do within reason. Um, and it was a great kind of, I mean, consultancy, you know, whatever people think of it, it was a great kind of first job for an economist because you had to keep learning something new on every project. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there were, there were times when projects would come along and you'd recuse yourself, you know, so you wouldn't argue in terms of, you know, massive government house building program, for example, you could back out of that if you wanted. Um, yeah. But when I saw the job at the Center for the American Experiment come up, and my wife's from here. Um, we'd always talked about moving back, but it was just kind of the ideal job because it's the, it's, you know, doing what I was doing before as an economist, yeah. but arguing, um, for things that I really believed in. Um, yeah. so, so all the stuff I was doing in the comment section, now I could get paid to do it professionally. <laughs> nice. Nice. And, and when was American Center for American Experiment, um, career started? Well, we were founded in 1990, I believe okay. by a guy called Mitch Pelstein who'd worked in the Reagan administration. Um, and I think for a long time, our focus, uh, funnily enough, actually was on the family and family mm. breakdown and the economic consequences of that. Um, and it's interesting, actually, in a lot of respects, um, if you read back um, that debate in the 90s and leading up to kind of uh, the welfare reform bill in 96, I believe, mm -hmm. a lot of these arguments were kind of had and won. You know, mm. people did believe that family breakdown was a bad thing of itself. And it was also a bad thing economically, you know, these kind of economic uh, fallouts. And the center, to some extent, kind of moved away from that. We got a, a, a new president in 2016, John Hinderarka. And we, our focus has been more kind of purely economic since then. But it does feel a little bit like a lot of these family breakdown arguments are going to have to be had again. You know, and there's, I mean, maybe we'll talk about this later. There's a, a, yeah. a, a wave of books out at the moment, not from the right, you know, um, of the spectrum that kind of highlight this. And also, I think what, what I try and do in the social capital report is link actually these two aspects of what the center has done historically. So mm. the family stuff and the kind of pure econ or the pure econ stuff, because you really can't see the one without the other. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. And, um, and y'all do a lot of great work there. So I'll be sure to put a uh, link to that in the show notes page. Um, and, and, and so it, it's great to hear your background and, and kind of how you got to where you're at today. One of the books that really got me started and on this path of classical liberalism, free markets, that sort of thing was um, Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman. Hmm. Um, then I read Fred, Free to Choose. Maybe I should have read it the other way, but regardless, <laughs> uh, that's really got me going. And the other big one, too, was Road to Serfdom. I mean, Hayek and yeah. Friedman are right up there. It's some of my um, top economists who I always go to and, and, and try to find more insights on the way in, in which the world works. Um, that was something that brought me into account uh, to economics because I also did accounting first. I double majored in economics and accounting in undergrad, and um, I, I liked accounting. Uh, I, was, I was good at it, but then I got kind of bored with it. Where you know mm. assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. It was so much by the book. Whereas economics could help explain how the world worked, and I could think outside the box more. I <laughs> just uh, had a lot more fun. Did you find that as well? Yeah. Um, Once I you got into that, it, I would say though that th there is there is benefit in knowing your way around a balance sheet. Yes. Um, even on some kind of rudimentary level. Yeah, um, and, I agree. Uh, I, actually, when I when I got my job as an as a consultant, one of the reasons I was hired was because none of the economists on this staff um, yeah. had any kind of knowledge. They couldn't look at like a, a statement, a company statement of accounts, and figure any of it out. Whereas I could, um, yeah. and that actually turned out to be to be reasonably useful. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and as an economist, so some of the data we're looking at are all spreadsheets anyway. And so it is important to know how to go through a spreadsheet and, and everything else. There's a lot of, a lot of overlap there. Um, when, when you're looking at some of these things, one of the big things that I want to focus our conversation is on um, social capital. It's something you've done a lot of work on. Um, there's a recent report that you put out about social capital that I think brings up a lot of good uh, information. For people, uh, for influencers, we were a lot of them who watch and listen to this, ep- listen to this, the Lepio Prosper show. Um, and, and so I wanted to, to hear how you explain social capital for one and what you see are kind of the indicators, um, what's happening across a lot of the states. Well, yeah. Um, so the reason I, I got at talking about social capital is I, you know, I, I live in Minnesota, which is a state with pretty bad policy in all sorts of ways, um, particularly the last year or so, things went kind of crazy last session. Um, but yeah, you know, we do have, you know, fairly high uh, levels of like median household income or something or GDP per capita. And you have to ask yourself, uh, well, how do I square this circle? You know, I'm mm. constantly talking about policy is bad, but why are these outcomes not terrible? Um, and so, you know, I, I always used to, I go around the state giving these talks about the state economy. And I used to close very often by asking that question and asking for suggestions. And I got, you know, answers of varying usefulness. Um, but then one day I was leafing through this report by uh, the Social Capital Project, uh, which is something that was run by the Joint Economic Committee of Congress. I think it was under Mike Lee's kind of sponsorship. Mm-hmm. Um, and what it had in it was this uh, map of America and all the states were kind of shaded in by their levels of social capital. So it was like a light color if you had lots of it, dark color if you didn't have much of it. Um, and what struck me was that, so if you look at, so for example, uh, employment ratios, um, the level of employment in a state, if you look at Minnesota, um, we are generally kind of in the top three. If you look at all our neighbors, they're generally up in the top five. Hmm. So you look at a state like Minnesota, which has very high uh, levels of personal income tax, a state like South Dakota, which has no personal income tax, and yet you get very similar labor market outcomes um, in terms of employment. So it's one of those things I'm looking at, why is this? You know, There's something driving these economic outcomes that's yeah. kind of separate from state policy. And when I saw this map um, in this report, which uh, shaded it in, um, I was struck by you know the kind of rough visual correlation between social capital and these employment ratios. So I mm. ran the numbers and the correlation was more than rough. It was actually there. Um, and then I did one between the kind of employment ratios and median household incomes. And that was there. So you have this link between social capital to employment ratios and employment ratios to median household incomes. Um, and you start to think about, well, why is that? Um, and so what I did is, is I looked into the literature on social capital, um, and there's a lot of it. Um, it was mm. a popular topic in the 90s moving into the 2000s. Um, it's, it seems to have drifted a little bit out of uh, favor. Um, its kind of peak was around 2000 when uh, Robert Putnam released Bowling Alone which is probably one of the few best sellers in social science of the last, you know, have many decades. But it's a fantastic book, fascinating book, full of interesting stuff. Um, and, you know, what I did is I looked at well, social capital. It's a difficult thing to define. It's a very difficult thing to quantify. But very roughly speaking, it's the kind of relationships that people have. So it's uh, networks and norms um, are the kind of, you know, key words that emerge from, I think that's Putnam's uh, uh, definition of it. So it's the networks and norms within a particular society. Um, so networks is uh, kind of a quantitative thing, um, and it's, it's neutral. Um, what I mean by that is you can have a network of people um, who come together and they, you know, they can go, kind of do good things. You know, so they can come together from a job club or something like that. Or they can come together, as was the case in Britain before the welfare state, uh, friendly societies. Um, you know, people will come together for what was an economically beneficial purpose. Um, or they can come together. This is the example that's always given um, the mafia. You know, everybody in the mafia knows a lot of people. They have a network. But you'd have a pretty hard time convincing anybody this was socially beneficial. Um, there's a great book called The Invisible Hook by a guy called Mm -hmm. Peter Leeson. Um, And he talks about, I think in a lot of respects, the kind of social capital that pirates had. 
um, so, you know, pirates, they had networks, they would come together. There were all these, th- th- one of the key things about social capital networks is that they're kind of extra legal, you know, and pirate networks had to be because no court was going to enforce a contract mm-hmm. on a pirate ship. Um, but that's, I think, is an interesting example, slightly different from uh, the uh, from the mafia one. Um, and, you know, so you get an example with these networks. There's different kinds of networks. There's, you know, bonds and bridges. Bonds kind of pull people together. Bridges are, you know, kind of one type of group to another type of group. Um, and, it, you know, the more social capital you have, uh, the, you know, the, the richer you tend to be in terms, in, in terms of it. Um, and the question then is, uh, how does this relate to, uh, you know, things like median household incomes? And that was really the kind of analytical core of what I did. I did this regression. The social capital report actually produces an index of social capital over 3,000 counties in the United States. And so I was able to use the sub-indices of that um, and run those uh, kind of regression against uh, median household incomes. And you find a relationship. You find a Mm. positive, statistically significant relationship um, between um, a couple of these variables um, and family unity being the kind of main one. Um, you know, so there's a couple of, I mean, you can talk about some of the details of some of the others, perhaps you will. But the key thing yeah. about all this is that social capital matters for economic well-being and the family unity component of social capital really is especially key. Yeah, yeah, that's no, great. Uh, and it's a great report that I will put up on the show notes page, like I said earlier, so everyone can look at it and look at all the charts. And um, it's the it's called the X Factor Social Capital and Economic Well-Being, a Quantitative Analysis. Um, so it's a great report overall. And it's just kind of scrolling through it now. You know, you see you had looked at employment ratios, which are important, uh, not just the unemployment rate, but actually what the share of the popula- working age population who are employed. Um, you have the State Business Tax Climate Index, which is the one from the Tax Foundation. Um, and so that's another key indication of what's going on out there, which, which looks at a lot of other fact, uh, uh, of taxes, whether it be income taxes, corporate income taxes, um, uh, other types that are out there, unemployment insurance tax. Um, and then it has, and then you have a median household income. And these are using, the latest report was on using 2019 data, probably so you can have consistency across all of your, yeah. your data that you're there, uh, which makes sense. And, and, and so then you can show what the social capital index score is. It, are, are these equally weighted or do you use different weights on the different measures that you're using to come up with the social capital index score? Uh, they're kind of weighted so that you can do the comparisons. The, the yeah. one thing I did, well, a couple of things I did. Um, so firstly, if you look at the kind of subcomponents, there's community health and institutional health. Um, there's actually this, this kind of four sub indices. Are you so? There's family unity, community health, institutional health, and collective efficacy. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the collective efficacy uh, thing is essentially the crime rate, um, and you know you find a relationship with that, um, but it's not really all that strong. It's not statistically significant. There's probably reasons for that. You know, things you need to kind of uh, dip into a little bit more, um, but it's not one that I did an awful lot of analysis on because of that you know, lack of uh, statistical significance. Um, If you look at the ones that were uh, positive and statistically significant, um, you have institutional health. Now, if you look at that, the the indicators that go into that sub-index, a lot of them are things like uh, presidential voting rates uh, in a county or something like census return rates and things like this. Now, those are fine, um, but when you look at it, it's not really the case I don't think that people get rich because they vote a lot. They tend mm. to vote because they're rich. And um, that's another you know, thing to look into, perhaps, if you want to refine the analysis later on. But I didn't look too much at that because if you're looking at ways of increasing household incomes, you're not going to do that by increasing the, the vote rate. Mm-hmm. Um, one thing that's interesting, I think, is the um, community health thing. This is kind of, you know, churches per capita and charities per capita and things like that. This is much more what I suppose when you talk about social capital, much more what people think of is the Putnam stuff, you know, the things we do together Mm -hmm. and all that kind of thing. Um, And what's interesting about this is that there is actually a kind of negative relationship um, between this and social capital. Um, initially, when I did the initial analysis, which is kind of surprising. But then when you look at the deeper down into the data, you find that what you're seeing there is that rural areas, which tend to be poorer, also tend to be more religious. And mm. also, you know, they tend to have more charities in them. And that kind of makes sense, you know, because charities will go where they're needed, I suppose. Yeah. So I put in um, controlling variable 
uh, for you know, kind of dummy variable for uh, urban urbanization, and that mm. did take care of the uh, community health thing. It flipped it positive um, and statistically significant, um, and it did the same thing to collective efficacy as well. Um, mm. So all the the signs kind of came out the way that you expect them to be. Um, but you know, if you look at the the coefficients, really. Um, the coefficient for family unity kind of is double the next biggest one. It's about mm. $5,000. Um, so, you know, if you can, in, if you can bump like one point up in terms of uh, your family unity in a county, you're looking at, you know, your median household income going up by about $5,000. So there's, there's, there's kind of big results there. If you think mm. about it, just to go back to the point about employment ratios, it yeah. does stand to reason that if you've got more people employed in a household, your household income will be higher. And yeah. this goes back to the family unity point, because if you've got a household, you know, that's got, you know, well, so you've got two parents, say, um, and then one earner leaves and you're left with one earner in the household. I mean, it stands to reason that your household income is going to be is going to be lower. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Great points there, John. And I, I think that it's something that's overlooked um, some in the data. I mean, because this kind of goes back to income inequality. When you go from two parent or two people in the household to one, well, then that's dropping off some of this household income that there otherwise would be. And when we have a larger number of people that maybe are on safety net programs for a number of reasons that are out there, that would also reduce the total income for households that I think we should take into account uh, when we're looking at this. And, and, I, and I think it's fascinating with the, with the report of what you're looking at with these different variables and then being able to compare how states are doing. Because there, there are some that are out there. There's, you know, Economic Freedom of North America by the Fraser Institute, which I think is a good one to look at when you look at government spending and taxes um, and labor market regulations. And they can correlate it with measures of economic improvements uh, and better livelihoods and flourishing and things of that nature. Um, there are other th other ones of social mobility where I recently had on um, uh, uh, Justin Callis, uh, who had worked with the Archbridge Institute on social mobility and how that's happening across states. But we talked a little bit about this idea of social capital, um, and which I think is really important. And there was a social capital project that was done for a while by Senator Mike Lee and the Joint Economic Committee, um, which did a lot of great work on this. And so I think what was nice about your report is how you're able to do this at the state level. And as we know, and we work a lot on state level issues, it's easier to kind of get things done at the state level than mess with the nonsense that's happening and going on in D.C. <laughs> in this laboratory yeah. of competition with federalism. Right. And so it, it, whenever you're looking at some of these scores, um, you know, Utah ranks number one. Right. Um, yeah, uh, and, then, yep. and then Minnesota is number two. Um, and, and, it, but, but then you also have like Louisiana, uh, rate dead last, um, which yeah. also in social mobility, they rank dead last. Um, when you look at Texas, Texas is actually in the bottom 10 under the capital social capital index score, along with places like Florida. Some of those things I, I didn't, uh, expect, I expected maybe them to be higher or, or, you know, doing better than, than what this shows. But I, but I wonder what your explanation might be given, you know, some of the other issues we see of people moving or flocking to Texas and Florida compared with other, other states that are out there. I mean, California still ranks pretty low as well, mm. um, along with New York. Well, there's several things to say about that. One is yeah. I think this is important at the state level for policy, because if you're looking at, you know, kind of red states like Louisiana, Mississippi, whatever, um, you know, you, you cut your taxes, say, um, but your economy and your economic growth goes up a bit, but perhaps not too much. And you'll get some, you know, on someone on the other side. say, oh, this proves that red state tax cut policies don't work. Well, no, it doesn't, because there might be headwinds like low levels of social capital. So if you look at these states like Louisiana, Mississippi, generally it's family unity, actually, that's mm. pretty lame. I mean, these are actually quite religious states, so they do quite well in terms of your know, community health. Yeah. Um, but they do they do comparatively badly in terms of family unity. It's a strange thing. If you look at a state like Minnesota, however progressively people vote, we have very low levels of uh, you know marital breakdown, very low levels of unmarried parenthood. Um, people in Minnesota vote very progressively, but they live very conservatively, um, and that explains you know a large uh, some fair portion of their. Um, uh, of their high household incomes. So that's a key thing to know, I think. You know, if you're, if you're looking yeah. at explaining 
the impact of policy on economic variables. Policy is not the only thing that drives variables, and you have to take these other things into account. Um, you know, so I, I think that's that's really important. Another thing about growth, and it's interesting to note that if you look at the states with high levels of growth, like Florida and Texas, they don't tend to do that well in social capital. And this is, you know, something for a future project, is that Minnesota, for example, has pretty lame levels of economic growth. Um, and when I did a very cursory look at levels of social capital and levels of economic growth, there isn't a great relationship there. Now, that may be that social capital explains levels, but not rates of change very well. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of it, there, there's kind of reasons for that. So if you look at social capital, you know, a bunch of people come together, they form these relationships and these networks and they have value partly because they're closed. Hmm. Um, you know, there's a, I, I talk um, at, at, at some length in the report about Avner Greif's work on the Maghribi traders in the Mediterranean. And what these were were a bunch of uh, uh, Jewish guys um, who spread out around the Mediterranean um, and they formed trading groups, a trading network. You know, so there were Maghribis in different ports around the Mediterranean. And to, for, to, to get over the fundamental problem of exchange, which is the, uh, I sell you something, you pay me later, you can just rip me off and run off with the goods. Um, you know, it, you, you essentially turn the prisoner's dilemma into an iterator prisoner's dilemma by building this network and saying, if you screw me, you're out and you can't hang your hat anywhere. You can't get a deal anywhere around the Mediterranean. And so that's how the Maghribis uh, built up this trading network. But it was within their ethnic group. So you have a couple of, I think, profound things flow from that. Um, one is that if you've got a state like Minnesota, which is like 90% white, and then you have lots of people move here. I mean, we have a very high refugee population and there's a lot of economic problems within that population, but that's because it's hard to, to break into these networks. Hmm. Um, you know, so, uh, so you've got lots of kind of the bonding social capital, but not much of the bridging social capital. Hmm. You know, uh, Minnesotans aren't renowned for being that friendly. Yeah, actually, yeah. There's, a, there's a joke up here, you know, um, a Minnesotan will give you directions anywhere except his house. Um, <laughs> I could tell you jokes like this all day, you know, but it's, yeah. it's a thing. But okay. I think to some extent that, was, that reflects this, these things of social capital. Um, mm. Another aspect, this goes back to the point about norms as well. If we yeah. talk about networks, you talk about norms, different norms of behavior are conducive to different levels of economic well-being. So when you get someone like Robin DiAngelo or Ibram Kendi say something like, any difference in economic outcome has to be the result of discrimination. Well, that's mm. not true. You know, the, the difference in norms matters. And I give one example in the report, again, looking at Minnesota's example. We have a, a very, very wide disparity, one of the widest in the US, actually, between home ownership rates for whites and blacks. Now, part mm. of that is because our black population is very largely, or to a much larger extent than other states, uh, made up of refugees. And many of them are Muslim, and they have religious uh, obstacles to taking out loans of interest, which, is, which does mean that they have a persistent problem accessing financing for house purchases. So if you look at that there, the, you've got some disparity there, you know, home ownership rates. And some portion of it, at least, is not driven by racism, but by the different norms of behavior actuated mm. through a network. So I think these are key things. You start to move into some controversial and fairly profound things once you start to explore this topic. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's fascinating. Um, all the different factors, because, you know, you're looking at a lot of things that many of the other types of indices don't look at which I think is good because you're able to reflect on it, explain it, um, because we are in a dynamic world with many parts <laughs> um, hmm. and, and, that, and that all these parts matter to, to the whole. Um, and so it's, it's kind of like coming at it from a micro angle, but then coming back up to a macro to see what exactly is going on. Um, and I think you know, from my perspective, the micro really matters. Ma macro is important. But if you can't get to the micro level, your 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 lack of you, it's it's hard to make macro factors change. Whereas yeah. on the micro level, you could do a little bit more on a one on one basis and things of that nature. Especially if you're looking at a policy um, that might influence these things. Um, and, and and so when when you're stepping back and you say, okay, here's the index, here's the rankings, and everything else, are there? Are there key lessons? What are some of the key lessons or principles that folks should know about that can help maybe support improvements in social capital and therefore well-being, or at least will, will not get in the way as much uh, compared to some other things that are done? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, as you know, it's a, it's an old debate. You know, micro foundations and macroeconomics and all that. Um, yeah. I personally think a macroeconomics without micro foundations is completely useless. <laughs> yeah, it's amen. Just, you know, <laughs> things floating. You know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and so, like, there are some of these policies, I guess, that are better than others that states should look mm. at um, to build social capital and everything else. What are what are what would be some of those? Well, it's a very difficult thing, this, um, because it's very easy to describe what's happened to social capital. If you look at, so if you look at family unity, for example, and if yeah. you look at rates of family breakdown, um, you know, um, divorce rates is an interesting one. A lot of people think this is down to people getting divorced more. In actual fact, the divorce rate is lower now than it was in 1980. Hmm. Um, what's happening, you know, I mean, but at the same time, we've got this huge expansion of, uh, you know, what you will call kind of unmarried parenthood, single mm. parenthood. It's not driven by divorce. It's driven by people who never get married in the first place. Hmm. It's also not driven really by teenage pregnancies. Teenage pregnancy rates have declined in recent years. It's people kind of slightly older um, yep. who have kids and just don't get married ever. Um, and there's all sorts of problems with that. So what that does is it opens up two deficits. Yeah. As a deficit of money, which we've kind of touched on earlier, you know, if you go from being a two earner household to a one, obviously that's a problem. Yeah. Um, you've got a second issue, though. I mean, just a, and, and, you know, we talked a little bit uh, when I came on about parenting. I mean, a deficit of time. You know, if you're, uh, you know, a, a single mother with two kids, I mean, I've got two kids, you know, me and my wife. I can't imagine how they do it. I mean, I've got yeah. all the respect in the world for them. I mean, I, right. I jump out of the window, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> you know, but I mean, but these deficits, you know, are real, and and there's a lot of research that shows that they have economic impacts. You know, mm. going through, um, you know, kids uh, from single parent households don't do so well at school, and this feeds through into into the labour market later on. Um, yeah. Now, the question is, what do you do about that? And this is very very difficult. You've got to ask, you know, why did this happen? You know, why Why did, uh, you know, rates of kind of family unity uh, fall so rapidly or so starkly? And what's interesting to note, actually, is that they didn't fall uniformly across the population. Um, there's a big gap in terms of uh, social um, and, e uh, and you know, kind of ethnic um, differences. So if you look, for example, at rates of... Um, uh, family unity or family disintegration which is the opposite of that look at rates of family disintegration across amongst you know the white population for rich whites it's it's got it's drifted down slightly since like 1980 for poor whites it's gone down quite a lot um if you look at the black population the rates were already kind of bad in 1980 they've got worse but again you see that difference it's it's got less bad the further up the social scale you go what's really interesting if you look at asian americans uh, you see that poor Asian Americans, they haven't really seen a decline um, in terms of mm. family uh, family unity. They've actually performed about they've actually performed at a level closer to rich whites than to other poor people of other different ethnic groups, which I think really shows that uh, you know norms. Again, we come yeah. back to this thing about norms. Mm. It's you know, these these kind of social norms really matter. Um, and so when you're trying to explain these different changes, you, these are the kind of stylized facts you have to explain. Um, yeah. The literature generally has come up with two kind of dominant explanations. One is uh, an economic one, which is the uh, marriageable men hypothesis, mm. which posits, this goes back to William Julius Wilson in the 80s, a, a tremendous sociologist. Um, but he argued essentially that, um, and it's been taken up, very a lot recently um oren cass is a supporter of this argument so is richard reeves of the brookings institution mm -hmm. uh, melissa kearney all these people kearney and reeves particularly have written recently um, about exactly this issue um yeah. but what, what it is essentially is that the decline of manufacturing employment in america has removed uh one way for unskilled men to earn a wage that makes them an attractive marriage partner um, and that this has, you know, driven this decline. It's worth noting there's a lot of kind of pushback against this. Scott Winship has got a really good report on this, um, which says, you know, actually, you know, that's not happened, you know, if you look at the data in a kind of different way. Um, so that, that one, you know, the kind of jury's perhaps out on that one. Okay. Um, the other one, the other main um, explanation, is, and I think you know, there's something to this, is just a change in social norms. Mm. 
You know, now, why yeah. do social norms change? I mean, they don't change, I don't think, because of the law. If you look at yeah. increasing tolerance for you know, homosexuality, I think mm-hmm. Will and Grace probably <laughs> had a lot mm-hmm. more to do with that than any government policy. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, so, it's, I mean, how do, you, how do you discuss changing social norms? If changing social norms is the reason, then there's a really interesting bit of research that shows, so, for example... If you believe in the marriageable man hypothesis, the idea is you come along, give these guys these great manufacturing jobs again, and suddenly everyone starts getting married and family Mm -hmm. unity increases. But there's really interesting research that shows that when you had the kind of uh, blue collar jobs women in North Dakota in recent years, none of those things which you should have seen happen did happen. Hmm. Um, and yet, when you look back at a similar thing with the Appalachian coal boom in the 70s, they did. So why did why were the responses different in the 70s to what they were, you know, 10 years ago? And the difference is social norms, hmm. you know, like the Asian Americans that we, we talked about. Um, yeah. And so if that's the case, I don't know what policy does to change that. Hmm. Um, there's various ideas that there should be an office somewhere that, yeah. you know, government department in charge of telling people families are great. I mean, well, or, I mean, government does plenty of stupid things or plenty of things stupider than that. But I, 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 I'm not sure it would be all that helpful. Hmm. Um, so it's one of those things, and I hate to say it, you know, I diagnose a lot of problems in this report and come up pretty short in terms of solutions. So answers yeah. on the postcard, anybody, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, John, but I, I like the humility, right? Sometimes we're too <laughs> quick to say, here's the solution, which as hmm. Thomas Sowell said, there are no solutions, only trade-offs. Uh, and yeah. so there, that's, I think, what you're getting at, is that there are these trade-offs that can happen. Um, a lot of my research is on institutions and the importance of institutions going back to like Douglas North and Friedman and, hmm. and others that are out there who talk about this, Hayek. Um, and I think it's more of the research that we need to be doing to figure out what the institutional framework should be. Um, I happen to come from the assumptions of limited government and trying to get government out of the way as much as possible. So that way you can let people flourish. Um, That's where I find is the best way to let people prosper. But at the same time, we need to be able to think about other ways, because if you try to put in a policy, there, there are going to be uh, intended and unintended consequences of that policy. And so if you're trying to deal with norms to your point here at the, at the end, I think that, that that's a really important thing to think about that is not easily done within a institutional framework of government, a top-down approach. In fact, yeah. you're probably unlikely to get that result that you're looking at or looking for. Um, and, and John, I don't know where you're at on this, but I, but I feel like some on the, the, on the right more recently have been more willing to have government step, put their finger on the scale a little bit more with government. Of, of having them step in, if you think about the net cons versus free cons or other debates, you mentioned Orton Cass. I mean, there, there's been these debates that are happening on the on the right, which I think actually is good. I, I think that it's going to help the arguments for the future. Um, but I also think that we need to be careful, to your point, about the trade-offs. Um, but I wonder what you've been thinking about some of these ideas that are out there about, you know, substantially increasing the child tax credit or other things that um, could be pro-family, quote-unquote, pro-family policy, but could also have large trade-offs in the process. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I mean one thing I'd say about the NatCon versus FreeCon thing is that, you know, whichever side you, you fall on, um, this, you know, lively intellectual debate on the right is a wonderful, uh, you know, contrast to the complete torpor on the left. Right. Where the only argument seems to be, you know, how much you can get away with. Yeah. Um, you know, how much further of, we get to socialism. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just just to digress slightly, if you look at Minnesota, um, I sometimes hear about the moderate DFLers here. Um, I know where they are. They never seem <laughs> they never turn up when it's time to vote. Um, yeah. And yet, um, you know, um, so uh, it's, it's a difficult one. Um in terms of the policies, and it's interesting with the, what you say about the child tax credits. So um, if, you, if you go back to that discussion about the deficits, the twin deficits, you know, government maybe can't do very much about the deficit of time. Uh, of, of time. You know, mm. um, that's a very difficult one. The deficit of money, well, I mean, they can throw welfare at this. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you've got your two earner family goes to one earner family and you lose a lot of income, well, government can come and dump some money into that. 
there is some evidence that this does have beneficial effects in terms of economic uh, educational and economic outcomes down the line from that. But it does come at a massive cost, both mm. in fiscal terms and also it does reduce employment. It does reduce economic growth. Um, it does reduce marriage as well. So, you know, mm. again, as you say, there's no solutions, only trade offs. Um, yeah. What's interesting is this is an argument that I, you know, it's very common on the left. We just enacted a huge expansion of trial tax credits in Minnesota, yeah. maybe the biggest in the United States. Um, but you do hear people on the right arguing for this. And I would say not just NatCons either. Sure. Um, you know, I, 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 it, there's an idea that we have to, you know, make an offer um, yeah. on this. Um, I mean, one thing I would say is if you look at some of the areas in Minneapolis, and, and there'll be similar uh, enclaves in cities all over America, not just cities either, you know, urban, rural areas have issues similar to this. But if you go to an area where, you know, 75% of families are you know one parent there's not a lot that tax cuts can do about that mm. i mean they can do something but in terms of prosperity you know let the people prosper there needs mm. to be a kind of mindset a culture of prosperity yeah. um almost which goes broader than just the policies um i mean th this is a difficult one you start to talk about you know the cut i mean we talked about it already the cultural roots yeah. of prosperity um i quote Ode galor um, in the report who actually lays out some of the norms which are associated um, with uh, higher levels of economic well-being. And they include things like, you know, smaller government, um, you know, families, um, a propensity to investment rather than immediate consumption. And all these things are really important. You know, you've, you've got to kind of foster the whole thing. Um, otherwise, you know, you're only going to get so far, I think. Yeah. Uh, good, good points there, John. There's a lot more that we need to study. I'm glad that you put out this paper and have this comparison that hopefully others will take and use. And I'll put this in the show notes. Um, you're doing great work there at the Center for the American Experiment. And so keep that going. You're also active, you know, on on X, formerly known as Twitter. And so we we met through that channel. And, and, and so I look forward to having more discussion and debate about this. Um, and so keep it going. And uh, uh, God bless you and your family, John. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it really has. It's a great discussion overall. Um, for the audience, please go out and leave us a five-star rating. Be sure to check out the report on Social Capital by John. And it's a great report that you don't want to miss. Please also share this with your friends and family. They might enjoy this as well. And um, be sure to come back. We'll have, we'll have a lot more to talk about next time. And until next time, let people prosper. Let people prosper.